episode 523. Woo! Hello, hello. We are Coming recording video version for Patreon.com slash Brain Candy and the normal dormal uh, audio version for all you yeah. podcast listeners. Hello, everyone. Audio, yo, yo, yo. That was terrible. How's, how's Sarah? I'm doing well. Yeah. Okay, I, uh... You know, I'm like happy, happy to be here. I got my mom coming into town tomorrow, so that's really fun. That is, and fun. Uh, you know, it, it's it's like a, a good day when I always like judge a day by like how many different beverages I get to have in a day, and not always, mm. but sometimes that can be like you know the the the, uh, the test for. Uh, and this is a a three drink uh, podcast. I got water, coffee, and. I just grabbed myself a glass of wine, so I think it's time to ditch the coffee and then move I on always, to like. A I'm going to tell Adam to bring me a glass, right? Oh, good. This I'm because so, I when you said like let's do a, a video one, I was like, well, okay, I guess like I don't need the coffee anymore. I'll get a glass of wine, and it is like almost two. Okay, That's I'm enough. asking him now. There's an open bottle. Okay, let's see if he f- does it. You know, and I know you love a. a an episode where Sarah has a glass. I do. I prefer uh, tipsy Sarah slash high Sarah. Oh, goodness. But here's why. Does she pay attention? Here's why. I love your here's why. <laughs> I told them about that in my training, by the way, and they all really <laughs> liked that. They said it's a great thing. Why Every do couple they like do that. that? Wait, because I don't understand. It's, it's like, explains like, context and like the the reason behind the feelings and it's like more validate (laughs) it's like easier to validate it's like what you have to do in order for somebody to be able to validate you here's why i feel that way so i I don't know if it's projection because it might be but i have anxiety so whenever i have a glass of wine that is like it takes an edge off right so i just assume that's true for pretty much everybody that yeah. Maybe they aren't anxious, yeah. but they just, it's a way of saying like, let's have a little bit of fun. Yes. Let's not be so worried and upset about stuff. I love that. And yeah. I wish that that were the, and that is the casual attitude that I have with wine in mo- in situations where I'm with my friends, but in like in you and everything like that. But, and we, I learned this when we, when I was in grad school and I would tell you about like when I would go out with therapist friends or the, there's like the, like I talked about maybe a couple episodes ago about the awareness, like the meta awareness of the feelings. When I, sometimes having a glass of wine can cause me more stress because it's like, what do I have to do today? What if a client calls me? What if I got to do, what if I, this? So it takes, I can't really be present. It's only when I, I there are when only you know, a couple of days where yeah. I can like really shut it off. And then I'm like, let's it's do go this. time. <laughs> You know, let's um, do this within reason and healthy boundaries. <laughs> let's do this responsibly. Responsibly. Okay. First, so, I have to start with, um, well, I have a question. Sarah, mm-hmm. when you're looking at the video, because we're yeah. doing the video version, is it in sync? Like when I talk, does it match? Now it is. Okay. Because earlier- For I don't one know second, it was not. For just okay. a second. Is it not on your end? Yours is not. <gasps> so like I keep looking away because I want to just look, hear the the words. Oh oh yeah, that's tricky. That's tricky. Maybe there's something. Uh, who knows? Yeah, we'll see. Okay. Yeah, I'm just well, waving to my nephew. Fun. He's driving out. Okay, so here's maybe the that'll story. be better if I like shouldn't even look at the video. Then you guys get. Then I'll like you know again probably gonna do something weird like you know <laughs> pick my nose or. Well, she did reveal she's not wearing a bra. So. Oh, I you're right. Yeah, the, it we, cuts we off right it. there, and it's you know it's like well, uh, like okay, uh, so you see some nips, like what but else? it's always like well, it's like a t-shirt, we get to? a t-shirt, baggy yeah, t-shirt. Yeah. Who wears a bra with a baggy t-shirt these days? Nobody, nobody really. Come uh, on. This is a story. My sister um, had somebody come to her house, you know, to give her an estimate on like a new garage floor, mm-hmm. and um, whenever he left, he thought he was texting his boss, but he was texting her. <gasps> oh. He called her a slut. Oh, no, I don't love these. Oh, no. Like, what do you mean? Okay, okay. Where do we want to start? I am 
d- I could not oh, believe. Lord, help us. Yes. <sighs> Listen, also, I've been watching a lot of Handmaid's Tale recently. Yeah. And uh, that show needs to be watched in small doses because now I'm like Thank raging you, against the patriarchy even more than normal. What? Give yes. me a ch- oh, cheers, by the way. Cheers. cheers. Hey, cheers. Thank you, Eddie. Um, what? on earth could have happened that could have given him enough information to deem her a slut. Well, I said to her, was he saying you were slutty or was he using it as a synonym for woman? Oh like, my God. Like that. I can't you know say how sometimes like as a joke, I'll be like this hooker over here, but I don't yeah, mean but like you get to <laughs> say that. <laughs> well, and like, unless you are a male hooker, you do not get to say that. He uh, was using it as a synonym. So it was just sort of like the slut said, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I, I hate that. I, don't, I, I, hate that mo- I hate that more, I think. Oh, my God. I don't. What do, you, what do you hate more? Yeah, I know what you mean about hating it more because that's just how he wants oh to see women. Like, the, you not only not have person. lost your label. Yes, correct. Not, you're, you're not only not a person. Like, like you couldn't have a name, you couldn't have anything like that, but it's a derogatory, a term that is so, ew, ew, ew. This is probably the person who's, like, commenting on a lot of, like, people. Like, any girl <laughs> yeah. who's being body shamed online by some fucking, dro- this is, it. I found him. <laughs> well, that's the thing about it that made me kind of sad was that, like, this is how a lot of men talk about us when we're not around. It's the locker room talk thing. Ew. That is accepted, and unless you have a decent man in the room to say, like, we're not doing that, oh my God. it just happens. And so she wrote back and said, fuck you, asshole. And he was defensive and, like, said she, like, had a problem because he, he, he's like, yeah, that is what a slut would say. <laughs> Classic slut. Classic slut response. Because he tried oh to pretend like God. it was, um, I am... Did she get mad enough? Yeah, she was I, really like, mad. Okay, good because I'm like, I, I wa- uh, give me his number. <laughs> yeah, well, and give give my mom his number too. She send she, the rice ladies after him. He claimed that it was like a voice to text. Um, Bull, yeah, fucking shit. And nah, then, no. So he did apologize. He was like, sorry about that or something, and then. She was still mad. Why, and he why, goes, you know, this, you have a problem. Why is this going viral? I know. Okay, say that to the last part. Is it, is, you have a problem? Tell me more. Tell, I'm just getting he, very He was up. just like, you have a problem. You can't accept an apology. Like, he gaslit her. Oh. <laughs> oh my God. Can you believe? Because of course I'm, he did. I'm, 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 I am in my feelings. As they, <laughs> I've been, I what would you have done is what I want to know. this. Oh my God. Uh, I would, well, please, I would be posting this all over online. I would be, I would be sending this to every single, uh, I, I would be using my blue check mark to the fullest extent of its ability, capabilities, or whatever comes with that. Whatever power that has, and it's not that much, guys. Don't get crazy. Yeah, right. That's it, all it is is that the message goes to the top of the inbox. I think that's about it. Yeah. And that's it. Whether somebody even answers or cares. But I would send it to anybody who would be outraged by that and feels like us. And I yeah. would f- fucking put him on blast because I'll tell you, remember that guy that I hired for a project a long time ago who had and he came into the house and did the job and really crappy and then I made him redo it but that's another story but he then I went out and I saw in his car he had a bumper sticker that was totally racist yeah and I was like I wish I knew that before I I would have I would have loved to hire any person well and especially I would have hired the exact person that bumper sticker was was being racist towards yeah for the job is right. who i would have liked to hire well, instead so i think that, that we should call people out like that because 
I don't want that energy in my home either. I know. I said it's a blessing in disguise because what if you had hired him, you know, and you would have had to deal with someone like that. But she said that she was glad that it happened because it made her really think about, like, Black Lives Matter and how this was such a small thing and it affected her so much that imagine if you had stuff every day, you know. Like, you can't imagine. Imagine. Right, and you just live. I heard. Oh, where did I hear this? I Still think it was on NPR. I heard this quote that was like, uh, "Trauma in a person can be can seem like their personality. Like you might look <gasps> at, you know, yes. and then trauma in a group of people can be mistaken for culture. Right. So like when people yes. see marginalized community. Behave, like, let's say pride. I see a lot of straight people judging pride and saying, well, they're so promiscuous and they're too sexual. Uh, you know, like trauma in a collective yes. can look like it's their culture when really yes. you did this to them. How about women? Mm-hmm. In a group, even like we, I saw some that was some, somebody saying like um, women shouldn't use their bodies and. I mean, probably on The Handmaid's Tale because I'm watching a lot of that. Yeah. And then it was like somebody said, well, men shouldn't be so tempted by them. Right. Oh right. God. And so, Susie's like. Susie's just been taking us to church. <laughs> the church of, we worship now at the church of Susie. Well, and by the way, I should say promiscuity, pride, or otherwise, you do you. I'm not yes. saying that's a bad thing. I'm just saying that we often judge groups and individuals right. And then don't account for why they, what happened to them, right? Right. right. That question, even what the, happened even to the them? Even the desire to express yourself in a way that may look promiscuous is, mm-hmm. beca- is a response to the oppression that they felt for not being able to express that it, every day in well, and you get when one you, day, so it's like, has anybody seen any mom who gets one night out to go, like... Oh, my God, the, right? She, somebody watch her, because she's definitely drinking too much and definitely going to end up on the bar, and, like, well, c- keep an eye on that one. That is such a good point. That is it. That's what, when you can't do it, and then it's like, oh, my God, freedom, I get to do it. So, yeah, when you got to repress all that forever, and then you get one day a parade, like... Let it all out. Be naked. Do all that. I don't get Fuck in the this street. I don't care. Fascinating. That's probably going to end up in like meme. I know it. There is so much to, to unpack, and obviously yes. we don't have time for it all, but those are all, like, that is food for thought. I'm going to think about this later. It's so good. I love it. I love it. But thanks to that guy for being a dickhead, because we will learn from it and uh, whatevs. But oh, man. I knew you'd appreciate that story. I sure do. Let's begin with... A discussion about up. how much we love shipping things right from our houses and our Pretty much everything offices. from my house is like one of my favorite things. <laughs> Stamps. Do I have to go anywhere? No? Perfect. Yeah. I love it. It's so awesome because you can ship any class of mail, any package to anywhere in the world just from your house mm-hmm. because you just weigh it, slap on the label that you print out, put it in your mailbox and your carrier picks it up. And the beauty is, not only does it save you time because you don't have to go there, but it saves you money too, Sarah. Oh, yes. Tell them how, Sus. As a matter of fact, you can get up to 40% off post office rates and up to 66% off UPS shipping rates. Um, it's a fraction of the cost. It's amazing. It's a no-brainer, saving you time and money. And uh, it's great for, like, if you're shipping out orders, let's say you're a small business owner, or if you just send a lot of packages to people you yeah. love that you might be missing right now, it's so easy. Mm. Stop wasting time going to the post office. Go to Stamps.com instead. There's no risk. And with promo code Brain Candy, you get a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to Stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in Brain Candy. That's Stamps.com, promo code Brain Candy. Okay. Uh, Sarah said she saw this article as well. So we want to talk about a school who had picture day, Ugh. and then I guess they had reserved the right to Photoshop anything that was deemed somehow provocative. But really what that amounts to is, um, you know, 
litigating like women's bodies and even yep. the slightest shadow of a cleavage was uh, how about shoulders oh yes shoulders yes oh 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 god I'm those post- sexy shoulders oh better cover up the, the place where your back connects to your arm yeah. god forbid what is it that the armpit crease looks too much like a fucking what butt crack vagina for you guys can you like anything with the fold freaks you out Sarah's man turns you on. I can't. So I'll post this picture in the video version and Sarah, I've sent it to you so we can see uh. the original one on, well, it's my left and the left of the screen, I think. And, um, then what they did to sort of make her more presentable <sighs> and it really, so what is it? An inch of difference on her it's one torso? Line. It's a line in a shadow. It's a line in a shadow. Of her so uh, supposed dumb. cleavage, but nothing. Like, okay, so before we started, you said you are not fired up yet well, about it. I mean, like I am, but when I read, remember when we were talking about the yoga one, and you had that, and yeah. I had that initial reaction, is because I, I mean, I couldn't imagine a world where, like, yoga is seen as. Like, the idea of a parent speaking out about this seems like fantasy to me. Seems like not even, like, a reality. I don't know. The yoga one just seemed closer, maybe because, like, I practice yoga and it seems like, what? But, like, I don't, I can't even describe why it did, I didn't have, like, that first initial outrage in the same way because it just felt like, Something that I would imagine happens a lot in um, places where girls need to be more modest. Need to be? Like, not need to be, but like where that's like more part of like, if you grew up in an evangelical place, I would see this as happening frequently. This doesn't seem like a one-off to me. Well, The yoga thing it... seemed like a one-off to me because like I had Mormon friends growing up. I had people who were like, oh, you need to cover up like that kind of... Yeah. I saw that more. Well, when, it, when I, I read didn't it, ever I kept see anybody looking. like resist yoga before. So that seemed more crazy yeah. to me. I, this is like- I kept looking though to see like if it were a private school, which would be different because mm-hmm. that's, as you say, pr- standard in a religious school or whatever. Yeah. But this was a public school. And as the article pointed out, they also had a picture in the yearbook of the boys' swim team in Speedos and bare torsos. Oh, my torsos. gosh. Yes. So okay. Yeah, you know what? Where's I was the probably black more bar outraged than Censoring then. that. I was maybe equally outraged because that part did make me like, oh, come on. You know what? Maybe. Okay. You know, I think what this is, what, what the only thing that I can do, like compare the two, is that this was just more of the same were like treating women this way. It felt like, yeah, put it on the list. Yeah. And the, right. When I like it's compared just another the two day. because like, yeah. Cause I was like, man, why was I so like, I sent like everybody that email about the yoga thing. And I'm like, this is crazy. Right. <laughs> and like, why didn't I have that same reaction of like, this is crazy. Right. To the women who are the young, the girls who are being told that their bodies are not acceptable, that their shoulders That's, and, are and the, sexualized. That shoulder thing that in said? particular in the article where it said the rule was that your entire shoulder had to be covered. Where does my shoulder end? Pick a point. Where is that? Right. I right. don't even know where that is. Right. Is that here? Oh, my God. Or like, and the fact that it doesn't sleeve? for boys, but like, ex- tell me, like, it's like how I love how you're. You always like to say, and here's why, and then explain that. I would. I need somebody to say, and here's why, and give me the explanation. And yeah. it needs to be good. Well, it tell isn't me good why because the answer my is shoulder that is women, not okay. This is a fascinating oh. paradox again of the way we treat especially young female bodies, it is the, it's oxymoronic because we simultaneously sexualize yes. young bodies, but we also 
try to protect them and shield them. And like, we think they're so dangerous. Oh my God. And that is what works me up. It's like, just our bodies are seen as sinful, shameful, uh, powerful, dangerous. It's like, fuck, these ladies are just trying to read a damn book and get an education. (sighs) Right. For (laughs) Thanks, Sarah. Uh, I mean, no, I'm just like, I, it just like sends me into this because I, I just imagine like where do, how do you, uh, there's a part of me that thinks that if, and I hate to go back to like the, we have to help the boys thing, but I wonder if we gave them a little more emotional, uh, like, like, they need to be allowed to express their emotions. Everything seems repressed and everything seems and because of that it like gets and it's turned into this huge cycle and this huge like pattern of behavior over s- centuries that is like oh god it feels overwhelming like I was heartened though by that? the boys the boys in the New York Times article were described as like they were fighting with the girls. They were okay, putting good. on dresses See, and wigs and That's it. That's yeah. the that's that's okay. That is kind of summarizing like what I'm really struggling yeah. to say is that when we give boys a little bit more freedom to explore and connect to their own femininity, mm-hmm. they can have more of a respect for the femininity of women. Their peers, yes. Their peers. And, oh my God, yeah. Let me I just like say that. that one way that you can empower your female body is with modern fertility. Yes, which is, knowledge is power. Knowledge is power. It's such a great service, super convenient. You just get this little test that you have in your house, and it will. if you send it off, they will send you an email with all the results of what is going on in your body. Mm-hmm. It feels like magic, like one of those sci-fi films. <laughs> from and where they would like, like... The amount of stuff that they tell you, oh, yeah. it's, it's so much more comprehensive than any report I've gotten from another, like my from doctor that, I've gotten. Yeah. I'm like, well, when I didn't even know this was a thing doctor. we were measuring. And thank you also for explaining what There's that is data. to me. I love knowing what these <laughs> me- n- 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 letters mean. Oh, I feel very empowered with that knowledge. Yeah, because that's the thing is like they provide the actual data. Here's your number. Here's, you know, how many... The, the fertility situation going on with your eggs and whether you have PCOS or other red flags or, you know, if there's something to worry about or if everything's like super fertile yeah. and you are like ready to go. And it just helps you make informed choices about your life, whether you want to have children or not. And it's so affordable. Yes. I don't know if you guys have been to the doctor lately, but oh. it ain't cheap. Right. Uh this is going to be much more affordable and convenient because you can do it in your house. Right now, Modern Fertility is offering our listeners $20 off the test when you go to modernfertility.com slash brain candy. That means your test will cost $139 instead of dollars, instead of the several hundred or even thousand plus dollars it could cost at the doctor's office. Get $20 off your fertility test when you go to modernfertility.com slash brain candy, modernfertility.com slash brain candy. All right, so let me see if I'm mad about anything else or if oh, that was the only I'm guaranteed thing. Guaranteed something I'm mad about. Gosh, I, yeah. I I'm, now I'm like again mad about the fact that I didn't get mad about that. Like, like I like look at what does that say that we're just like uh huh. Well, sometimes it just uh-huh. feels like well, yeah, yeah. Obviously, we already know this. Right. But it's still it's offensive. Like, oh, shocker! It's like every year. Scoops there was a great shock. article in the New York Times about. This magician who I had never heard of named Burglass, last name Burglass. Um, And he's 94 years old. And he has... um, Sleight of hand is a bit more shaky. Well, truly. Like, he retired 20 years ago, probably for that reason. I mean, it does get a lot harder to do tricks, whatever. But he revealed basically all of his tricks... Except one. And I'm totally fascinated. And since you love magic, I know you, you know I do. <laughs> Remember when okay. we were talking about people that I could date? You might want to throw a magician on the list. I don't know why, well, but yeah. could you imagine me being constantly like amused by... Do you know a magician? I'm thinking... I know. What this about is so that funny guy that we that's met? Like a reality that's actually like a real Do you remember when we met that... Oh, wait. He's not a magician. 
Who? Who? <laughs> the comedian um, Ivan Decker that we met at the Comedy and Magic mm-hmm. store. He's married to a comedian. Uh, uh, no, that's oh, Ian Bag. That was Ian. Oh, yeah, the guy who was a. Yeah. I don't think he liked me. Oh. Well, I think he was like. Mm. He's dead to me then. I don't know. Maybe but that's just my instinct. He was probably instinct. scared of us. We're a, uh, who wouldn't be? A lot. <laughs> and we were both wearing heels that night. And us coming in. We already had, like, I come in BDE. And now you got me and Susie and we're in heels. Oh, right. And Lord. I'm like the mom on the night out. It's this a whole is thing. what I'm saying. <laughs> right. Come on. Okay, okay, Golly. Okay. We were t- too hot to handle. Stay on track, Susie. Okay. Yeah, focus, focus. So, okay. The essence I of I did not a- take my meds today. So it is. <gasps> oh, my God. We are flying by the handle here. Okay. So the essence of most card tricks includes a point at which the magician touches the deck. There is one card trick where this magician does not touch the the deck at any time. Uh So it is confounding to magicians and audiences alike. Like how does he do this trick? It's called... Any card, any number. You say any card, and then you pick a number from 1 to 52, Uh and then he, no, somebody else, I guess, because he doesn't touch the deck, uh, goes Uh down the deck to that number that you said, and that card will be the card that you said. So if you say the 35th, they'll flip that card, and that's the card you chose, like the seven of diamonds or whatever. Yeah. Okay. So everyone was like, I think they all assumed it had to be a stooge, which is somebody in the audience yeah. who is in yeah, on the joke on. and picks the number that the magician wants them to pick. Mm-hmm. But he's done the trick for other magicians um, one-on-one. Oh, my God. I get goosebumps everywhere. <laughs> I don't know why. Like, oh, I don't know why I love it so much. The The... I love a mystery. You do. That's why you don't Google people. Yes. It's weird. Yeah. I love a mystery, but I don't mind a spoiler. That's interesting. Ooh, another paradox. Yes. Okay. But that is, um, okay, so what's going on? Okay. So the journalist for the New York Times asked now the magician. I'm like all these magicians who are, I'm dying to know. Are I don't know the answer, know? but yeah, I am dying to know. Okay. The journalist said, can I come to your house? The journalist goes to his house. He's, as I said, 94. He's had it. He's sick of all this shit. (laughs) So (laughs) they're talking about his career and this trick and whatever. And the magician was like, you know, there is no trick. That's why I haven't told anybody. Like, there's no trick to tell. Which makes it even more delicious. What do you mean? And the... He's like, well, what what card would you choose and what number would you choose? And the journalist said, I'd choose this card and this number. And, he's, and he paused, but then they moved on. That was the end. And then eventually the journalist said, well, will you do the trick? And the magician got furious. And he was like, how dare you? How dare you? You do a trick for me. I'm not doing Dance, it for you. Dance. Right. He's like, I have nothing to prove. I'm 94. Like, right. get, get off my back about it. You're such a good storyteller. I love it. I'm <laughs> then, like hanging on the edge of my seat here. And then a few minutes later, the magician appeared to soften. And he was like, all right, over there in my desk, there's a few decks of cards. Get them out. Pick what whichever deck you want. have a few deck of cards. <gasps> and pick whichever deck. Pick okay. whichever deck you want. And then... Uh, see if, see if it worked. Yeah. And so the journalist counts down to the number he said, and it's one off. Oh, and the magician had said beforehand, I might be one or two off. Oh, and then he was, I get and so, goosebumps. I do too. It's like, like I'm there. If you're oh, on Patreon, I, you can yes. see. Ah. And so like, not only did he do it anyway, even though he was mad? But he kind of yep. made it even more interesting. Because like, and the why? journalist went to another magician and was like, what is the deal? Why was it one off? What's the scoop? And the guy's like, I don't know. He messes with heads, not with decks. So he was just trying to mess with you. What is your theory, Sarah? He is a witch. 
<laughs> Do you think that when is, he got so angry, he's something he's he, there's something. Like, do you think when he got angry that he really was like, okay, now I got to fix this. I got to make it happen somehow. And then he somehow got it. And then he pretended like, oh, I'm softening now. I'm re-, but really he was just ready. I do kind of feel like he was ready. Like, like I've seen The Prestige. Yes, my favorite movie. To know, I know. And that's why I always watch it. Anytime it, like, I'm like, what do I want to watch? I'm like, yeah, I'll watch Prestige. It's Susie's favorite movie. It's so, so good. It's so good. And it's always like the final act. Like there's always one more, you know? Yeah. It's not really over when it's, oh my God, I get goosebumps again. Well, yeah, they said, I like- think that he knew it the whole time. And, and, oh, oh, come on. Let's, let's really like break down a magician personality. You've been a magician your whole life. You are in your, you've retired in your 70s, whatever. Yeah. We, we know that, mag, like, I would imagine magicians love to, like, spend a lot of time working on, in order to, to get to the point where you're that good, you practice a lot. And so one, what if he's just been, like, practicing and kind of, like, waiting for the opportunity to have, like, his, like, one more act? And mm-hmm. it kind of was all a, a, a yeah. setup, and because it feels magiciany, the getting angry, and that's not a normal like emotional reaction. Yeah. Maybe he would have to other things. Okay, maybe that's like part of the. I, I want to believe it is part of the act. I think and so. Just knew. I I'm think kind of everything with these people is intentional. Yes. It did say also in the um, article, like magicians lie to their audience all the time. I mean, that's yeah. how you do, do yeah. things, but they don't lie to each other. And oh, so no. he's denied having a stooge all this time. So I'm inclined to think it's not that. Yeah, but I like, think it's that either. It does oh, feel man. like so he True doesn't magic. touch the deck and he just says guess a card like pick a card mm-hmm. and then pick any number like one through 52 yeah and the and number then that, that you card pick will be the number will in the be deck. that number yeah huh and I think it's oh, really cool. Look at cool. this. Like, th- th- this is like, I'm sure what conspiracy like theorists think. We're, like, yes. Th- Sarah's like, I'm going <laughs> to sit here and I'm going to like, hmm, well, scratch what? my head for 10 seconds as I record a <laughs> podcast. And somehow I'm going to come up with We've the answer it. that journalists <laughs> and magicians alike have been One thing that years. feels like magic but Perfect. isn't is how amazing Quip toothbrushes and yes. toothpaste and mouthwash work in my mouth. Correct. That a clean mouth Correct. and happy teeth is magic. It really is. I don't know if you've tried the Quip, uh, the Quip um, mouthwash yet, Sarah. But you no. got to. I keep having to order. I keep forgetting. But I. Use it's their gum awesome on the because you know how disgusting the normal bottles of mouthwash are, and yes, you have I to do. like store and them. They're huge. Per- yeah, they're ridiculous. These are I'm great on because limited space here. The mouthwash is concentrated, so it comes in a small package, so it's better for the environment. And then you put it in this the dispenser that you can reuse and it looks beautiful on your counter just like the toothbrushes it's not an eyesore right it's like a Highly matching recommend. set now oh i like i like it's a matching set it's super cute Try but the also That's my fave. effective yes. and they send you the new brush head the thing mounts to your mirror it's a whole the whole yes. scene of so oral affordable. it's great when i go to visit friends houses i love it i go over and i see the quip <laughs> toothbrushes in there all like everybody Stop waiting, and you I'm guys. Like, They're mm-hmm. awesome. That's right. Everybody's on the quip train. They finally made oral hygiene sexy. Yeah. Um, if you go to getquip.com slash brain right now, you can get $5 off a mouthwash starter kit. And that's $5 off a mouthwash starter kit, which includes a refillable dispenser and a 90-dose supply of Quip's four times concentrated formula at getquip.com slash brain. That's G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash brain. Quip, the good habits company. Give it a try, you guys. Yes. Anyway, I do love Mm -hmm. that it's like even stumping the magicians. And, you know, it's just fun. It's fun. Yeah, I love it. Well, we'll think about I, it though. The the one that will forever get me is the one that David Blaine did to Harrison Ford in his kitchen with the lemon. Yeah. Do you know this? Yeah, I saw that. 
Uh, what is? What do you think? I, What's your theory? I mean, it must be something in how he's holding the lemon and cutting it. And like, mm-hmm. but didn't he have somebody else open it, or he opened it? Yeah, every part of it, you felt like, well, that eliminates that theory, right? And yeah. like, I just, and most of the time, I'm anti David Blaine because I'm like, Ugh, yeah, yeah he's kind of a bag. Yeah, and mm-hmm. and but that one and Harrison Ford's reaction is just so good. Because that's how I feel. I'm like, get out of my house. It's like you want to know. But get back in here and do another one because that was so fun. <laughs> the mystery is fun too. Gosh. So, okay. Next up. I love, I love magic. Right? I'm going to talk about this magic. really cool art situation. I'm going to show love art you. situations. I sent you the picture. Okay. There's okay. an artist who uses like um, used palettes, like wood palettes and stuff to okay. make these giant troll sculptures. Oh, wow. Oh, I love it. I love it too. It feels like so, um, it's like a, being inside of a fairy tale. You know what? If, if there were a troll, that's what it would look like. Yes. Like there, the sculptures are humongous and they're beautiful. And you just think that's a troll I'd like to meet, like a friendly troll. Totally. And it also which I hope maybe the if this was the artist's um, intention, yes. that makes me feel more connected to nature. And it well, is and inspiring was, me to go outside. Yes, that was the intention. This artist... Works, work, not law, not it, easily, easy to pick up, effective. I can't wait to go outside. Like if, if you're on the Patreon and you can see how beautiful it is, it's this gigantic troll in the middle of this pristine gorgeous natural environment and that was his intention he did it all over the world he put them in various places and forests and stuff the downside and i wonder what you would say is the solution to this and it's like the the problem with a lot of things where for instance like during the pandemic when everyone started going camping Mm -hmm. but then there's a downside which is Mm -hmm. trash and Mm -hmm. the destruction of these beautiful special places so it's like you want to encourage people to get out and experience yeah. nature, but then everybody does, and then everybody wants a selfie with the troll, and then there's just garbage, and humans are so destructive. So, like, is there a solution to this problem? I think the, uh, I think the problem is we're in the transition phase. We're in a phase where a lot of things have to adjust. You know, we've, we've talked personally, and I think on the show, about how, like, the future generations get it a little more and they care a lot. Like they care a lot. Yeah. So I think that the awareness that we're raising with these things, which is yeah. the intention, is effective, but not on the generation whose current like whose actions we're we're looking at right now. Mm-hmm. It's the ones who, in the same way that I have an uh, appreciation for art because my mom took me to museums, but I was definitely like, I don't want to go, that stuff when I was little. And now I really respect, like, you know, the yeah. art world and have, like, a love for it. And so I think that the it's, it's already too, like, it would require our parents to have had, like, and that's why, you know, some of us have those feelings about nature because we were exposed to it and mm-hmm. and taught to love it in that way and it's going to take a couple generations for that you know, to be the message hopefully it takes less time than that i was even thinking about this kind of idea when i was watching old episodes of um chopped on food network oh yeah okay those are the type of shows you can just put on in the background they're there totally. and then you can see like what year they were at mm-hmm. the end and I can't believe how often I see a panel of all white male judges or even like the whole episode is just all white men. And I'm so thankful that I'm aware of it because even five (sighs) years ago, I would have Oh my gosh, such a good point. Yes. And so aware, you know, I used to think, what's the point of awareness? All these awareness campaigns. It actually does work. Yep. Because when you go back and watch the other stuff, you see it through a different lens. Yeah. With the new awareness. Yeah. And I think that's so the same for true. environmentalism. Yeah. I, it, it's, this, I mean, so many. Yeah. Totally right. So, so that's what I think. I think we have to trust the process. And that doesn't mean we stop doing those things. Yeah. And 
we have to educate um, people. Yeah, I think yeah. it's an education thing, and people are going to figure. I mean, they're going to figure it out. It's just an adjustment process. And I think if, we also need to stop valuing putting so. Okay, good luck with this one, Sarah. Like right after you solve, you know the. It, or, have peace in the Middle East, you can work on this. Um, like, we need to stop <laughs> valuing, uh, uh, like, taking a picture with something more than the experience of it itself. This is goes back to my mindfulness, uh, you know, like, whole rant I went on last episode of, like, we got to be in the moment because if we're not, we're just thinking, how is this going to look later? Mm-hmm. No, that's not empty. That's not doing any of the work that these things are supposed to do ah so if you want to see his art or where these trolls are the website is trollmap.com um but yeah they're beautiful i hope he keeps doing them but i guess are they in the u.s i think some of them but not all of them um but it feels like a norwegian thing to me (laughs) right they it love does. trolls out there. They so. love anything whimsical. Yeah. And they fully believe in them. Like, don't tell somebody from Norway that there aren't fairies and trolls. They will be like, here's my evidence. No way. For sure. I mean, that's been my experience, unless, like, they're all in on a joke. Of, Is uh, it like, kind of like us with ghosts? Do you think? I think it's even more embedded in the culture and, like, the the, like, you know... I, yeah, I think it's even more than that. That's real cute. Because it's like everybody. And like that's, yeah, it's like a thing. We're going to need some Norwegian people to confirm Wait. this. Yes. Weigh in. I'll call my friend Heather. Shout out to Heather. Um, okay. Mm, the last thing I will say is um, I did see a great documentary called The Last Days. Yeah. It's from 1998. I liked that um, oh Netflix suggested it to me and just, I forget the way they worded it, but it was sort of like, I think it was called Hidden Gems. Oh, yeah. Which I, like I guess means like an older documentary that you might not have seen right. yet. It's called The Last Days. Yeah. And from 1998, that's old. Yeah. It, was, it won an Oscar. It was a Steven Spielberg documentary about the Holocaust. Oh goodness! Oh, so, and like you know, listen, light. well, yeah, and but here's the bonkers thing. Okay. okay, I have a doctorate in religion, people. I'm I've been exposed to a lot of stuff about yes. the Holocaust. She knows some shit. I know some shit. It is amazing to me, and I'm grateful for it that every time I see footage or hear a story, mm. it is just as visceral and shocking as the first time. Oh. Mm-hmm. That's how this felt. I was just like, how am I still blown away by this? But it's because it, you just it cannot be. conceive right. Right. that this really happened. Right. I just wanted to tell this one story that I just specifically was transfixed by. You know how when they rounded up the Jews, they didn't know where they were going. And so they were told to grab their possession, their, you know, their valuables. They thought they were going to take them with them. But, of course, they didn't. They gave them oh, over, right? right? They took them. Oh, God, and the God. one lady that was in it, she said her mom had sewn uh, their diamonds into her, the hem of her dress and said, if you, like, the mom must have had some sense of, like, mm-hmm. what was going to happen. I like, I like And this the mom. mom said, if you ever need bread, get those diamonds out. So then they get to Auschwitz, of course. They're stripped naked. And she remembers these diamonds, so she yeah. takes them out of the hem, and she's holding them in her hand, and she's like, what am I going to do with these fucking diamonds? So she puts them in her mouth, and she's approaching, like, the guard at the front of the line, and she sees that they're checking people's mouths. So she's like, great, now what am I going to do? She swallows them, yes. of course. Yeah. So then the mm-hmm. entire time she was in Auschwitz, she would collect her bowel movements. Oh, my God. And get the diamonds out and do it again. (gasps) And she still has them. Oh, no. Okay. Well, you know what? You know what? Uh, There is, oh, God. There's something 
about that makes me want to cry a little yes. bit. Yes. And there's something like about the human need to just survive and like Amen. And, and it like, meant something, do something to her. Something it that was matters. Hope. Yes. It was hope. That's and what that's that was. Like, yep. That's like the man's search for meaning kind of thing. Like you just have to have a task. Uh, like my mom said, when like, like chop wood, carry water, like that, whatever that means to you, if it is the same thing that you have to do every day, you got to like shit out yeah. diamonds. And, Cause you know, she would, they, then would, they you were do that to... and that's how you make it. To, oh, fucking a, that's like, I was just like, where somebody I st- has to be. I stopped and I paused and I said, Adam, we're in the dark, you know, watching in bed. <laughs> he's doing his own thing. I'm like this lady. And I'm telling him this story. And he's like, <laughs> that's my crazy. Reaction right now. Um, but, oh. like, they were allowed to go to the latrine once a day, and they would go over these holes. And so she wouldn't go over the holes. She would have to go, like, so that she could collect it. And she, when she went home, she turned them into a brooch and a tear shape because of all the sadness. And, you know, it's a fairly family heirloom now. Oh. It's a beautiful thing, but it is just like, holy shit. Literally. Literally. Literally, literally, literally holy shit. Well, now there's a poo story that I really. Me like, too. I was like, this? a poo story would bring a tear to my eye. Full circle, for sure. Okay. Oh my goodness, Susie, that was a very excellent story too. <laughs> S- coming in with excellent, excellent stories today. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, I'm um, very much high, oh, emotional roller coaster over here. One thing that's not an emotional roller coaster is best fiends because we just have one emotion, love. Oh, okay. This, I'm going to go ahead and say, uh, I'd like to say a big thank you to best fiends for <laughs> getting me, getting me, uh, helping me wind down after yes. a very long day. I happily treated myself to some very um, intentional self-care where I was like, you need to just... Let your brain relax and unwind. Play some rounds. Oh, gosh, does that feel good to do? Yes. We all need it. We all need a break from life. And Best Scenes is so fun. They have new characters all the time. It's so charming. Oh, they just released a new one. Go go up the levels, compete with Sarah, but not literally. Mm. Just like brag. about Oh, a lot it. of people are beating me now. They you guys kick my <laughs> butt. Don't worry, I'm still trying to you know get back. But Download. it's not a competition. Only against yourself. <laughs> Download Best Fiends free today on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Sarah, we what? have a guest today. Oh, I love a guest. I interviewed the inimitable. G.J. Ectern <gasps> Camp, the filmmaker behind the greatest film yes! of all time, Frank and Cindy. The greatest film of all time. I hope you Solid watched- gold. So- <laughs> Solid gold, G.J. is. And I've told you guys to watch Frank and Cindy on Netflix. I hope you've done your homework. And it's so good. I've watched it three times. And remember when I was like giving you shit for watching it three times? Sure. And I was like, nope, I totally get it. And I don't mean I'm watching it three times because like I wasn't paying attention enough. Nope, I was paying attention enough all yeah. three times to know that I wanted to watch it again because it's that funny. It's so funny. But I have noticed, and I told him this, that it really resonates with people who had a little bit of an, a dysfunctional upbringing. And people that have like really great parents are like, traumatized by it yeah. which cracks me up yeah because that's like, what not my this? litmus test okay Th- the, uh, that is a good one because that like, is so funny i'm like watch this movie what'd you think if they're like i was disturbed i'm like oh we don't we're not we're not we're gonna not the think same. the same jokes are funny we're not the same we're but not. i wanted to talk to him about his upbringing his filmmaking his parents it's fantastic Let's just welcome him to the show. G.J. Camp. thank you for coming to the Brain Candy Podcast. Oh, my gosh. G.J., welcome to Brain Candy Podcast. I can't believe this is happening. You have no idea how excited I am. How did you even come across the film? <laughs> well, my sister watched it about a thousand times and was like, listen, this is important. This is a public service. You have to watch this film. It's the best thing that ever happened. 
And then I watched it and I agreed and I couldn't stop. Like I couldn't stop thinking about it. Yeah. How does it feel to make the greatest film of all time? <laughs> Wish I had some money. <laughs> you know what? Who needs money when like you are now a legend? Well, I mean, obviously I appreciate that you like it so much. Um, it, it, I will say this. I do think it's the best thing I ever did and maybe will do just because the planets aligned in such a peculiar way that my parents were so amenable to this very odd process. Um, but I, I, having it been the thing that I am the most proud of, I kind of do wish more people had heard of it at the end of the day, you know? Well, is it a situation where it's sort of grown over time and it just kept building steam or what? Well, the kind of the, the, the the backstory kind of goes like this. I never set out to make a film about my parents. I really would have, at that point in my life, kept as much distance from them as humanly possible. Um, okay. <laughs> but what I, I was basically, I had all these old VHS tapes of Frank's um, like performances that had been recorded off of like Solid Gold and American Bandstand. And it occurred to me that the tapes were going to last forever. And I got this little device that allowed me to like convert all the stuff to digital. And I was doing that one day. And then I thought like, well, wouldn't it be funny to like sort of make something for my old website that I had where I film him for a few minutes and I kind of intercut it and I make a little short. And so I made that. And then long story short, I was working some job with this fashion photographer guy from London. And he was like, I'm getting into films now. And I had mentioned, you know, it was like, what's your deal? And I was like, well, I make little movies too. And he wanted to see it after I told him about it. And he was like, we're going to produce this as a whole documentary. And I'm going to send you to, uh, to London when this is over. And we're going to make this film. This is, this is great. And so I shot over a year. I kind of like forced myself to do it because I was like, well, this could be a big opportunity for me. I mean, I never wanted to be one of those guys who was like, oh, my life is so interesting that I have to film it. You know, <laughs> that wasn't really my take, but I was kind of motivated by this other guy. And then I wait, got. Wait, wait, wait. So yeah. like, did you did you not think? That it was interesting beforehand. It was just your normal and you it hadn't occurred to you that this was I just, remarkable. I, I thought it was kind of awful, really. <laughs> Okay. I, wasn't, I wasn't like this, this, I was like, well, it's maybe like awful in an interesting way, but I wouldn't necessarily think anyone else would find it particularly entertaining. Um, is, you know, cause I just assume, you know, one finds your own family as interesting or as, you know, as, as complicated and, and, you know, entertaining as you might, I, I don't know. I just wouldn't think like, oh yeah, you want to watch these two people yell at each other all day. Like I, <laughs> And that's really, and the moment when I realized that it could work was actually in the film where they're arguing and I go, oh my God, you guys are solid, solid gold. gold. Like, because the other thing is, is, you know, even if you you know interesting people, you point a camera at them and they completely clam up. Yeah. And so to see them just doing their thing on camera, like, like no one was watching, I was like, oh, well, maybe I can capture some of this. You know? And then when you said you guys are solid gold, even though they were having a knockdown drag out, they broke to look at you as if, like, you were crazy. <laughs> yeah, like, what's he talking about? <laughs> it didn't occur to them that they were interesting, right, in that moment or ever? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think my mom always wanted her moment on camera, you know, and she performs a bit, and Frank kind of would sort of go back and forth with it, where he'd be like, oh, yeah, I have stuff to stay, or, oh, my God, who's going to watch this? Oh, no, pay attention to me. Oh, no, this is weird. Why are we doing yes, this? Yes, there was some ambivalence. Yeah. Uh-huh. And, and ultimately, I went to London. The guy kind of, like, left me high and dry, and I, it didn't really – nothing came of it. And then I gave it to – I got this random email from This American Life's, like, mailing list saying they were making a television series and they were looking for ideas. And I was like, well, I have this, like, half-completed documentary. Maybe you'd be interested in it. And so I sent it to them, and they were like, let's do it. And I remember thinking, like, this is it. I'm, I'm in. Like, This American Life's going to do a whole TV episode on Showtime about my film. But it ended up being a bit of a double-edged sword because I don't know if it, it people really s realized that the documentary was mine. It was more like it was like This American Life made right. that out of this kid's footage, you know. Like maybe it was they were responsible for making it good. And then it also shot myself in the foot because I couldn't submit to big festivals because they were like, "Well, this has already been on This American Life, and we only want you know premieres." And I didn't know. I was too naive. I'd never done festivals before. And so over and over and over again, I, I kept getting rejected because it had already been out there on this kind of show that I guess not a lot of people even, you know, kind of came and went. And so I kept thinking, like, here's my big chance. Here's my big chance. And ultimately what happened is I got approached by a guy I know who wanted to make it into this remake. 
And I was like, well, as if I want to do this again, I absolutely do not want to do this again. I don't want anything to do with this ever again. Um, but I thought, well, if it gets people interested in the, in the original, that's great. And so we did the remake and I basically forced Netflix when they did the Netflix deal to take the remake. I was like, you can take the documentary for free. Just take it. Just please put it on Netflix. You are kidding me. <laughs> yeah. So they, so they basically put it on Netflix and, and then it just sat there. And for the past, I don't know, five years, I just sort of be like, I, I can feel that it goes in waves. So there'll be like a day every month where all these people will like tweet at me and be like, oh my God, your parents. And then I won't hear anything about it. And then another day, like five people will mention it. And I think it's like the ups and downs of the algorithm. So yeah. I'm completely dependent on the Netflix algorithm to determine whether or not people see the film. So for it, and I don't know if hundreds of thousands of people have seen it or five people have well, seen right, it. I they're have super no clue. mysterious too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's the worst. But I'm so grateful that it is there because even though it is super funny and it is like medicine for my soul, there you the film really deals with a lot of important and you know, complicated stuff. Family dynamics and substance abuse and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> Hi, doggy. Who's this? She's going to bug me, so I got to... This is Forrest. Forrest is a beauty. Yeah. She's a bombshell. Oh, my gosh. So many blondes on camera right now. <laughs> I have a type. Don't steal, yeah, don't steal my thunder, Forrest. <laughs> um, and so, like, I have a theory. I want to know if you have noticed this or if it's just my own anecdote. I mean, I keep telling everyone to watch it, and so our listeners keep reporting back their feelings about the film. A lot of people feel the same way I do. And some people are like <laughs> somewhat disturbed by the content. Right. Sure. And I, the, the thing that seems to be a pattern is that people with like really good parents and functional homes, like are traumatized by it. But people like me who relate to your story, it's comforting. Have you noticed this pattern? I think I get three responses usually, and they're kind of divided up. It's like 49, 40 to 49% is people that are like, uh, you know, I'm not alone. You know, I went through all this shit. You know, it's, it's great to see that, like, you know, I, I could relate to a lot of these things. They made me think about a lot of things. It's sort of like ther therapeutic. Yeah. And then there's people that are like, whoa, that was a lot. I mean, I don't want to hang out with those alcoholics. I mean, they're out of control. And then there's, like, the 2% that are, like, the angry stepdads that are just, like, why did you, where were you so mean to Frank? Why are you <laughs> trying to exploit your parents for fame? And I'm like, I, don't, I wasn't. I don't know what I was doing. <laughs> I was just... So they might feel victimized themselves. Because the they're like maybe a Frank yeah. themselves or maybe they <laughs> right. have a, ste a stepkid that doesn't like them. I don't know. But then there's a, like there's this amazing IMDb review on right now that is so vicious. It's like this kid is Frank himself, a one hit wonder with a film that no one even cared about in the first place. And I'm like, I never thought I'd come out of this with people like picking on me. <laughs> <laughs> You're the problem here. I'm the <laughs> Well, what what category do Frank and Cindy fall into? How do they feel about their? Oh, uh, well, that's a funny story, actually. Um, she's licking my armpit. Would you not? You know what? She's People only could human. See this. People could see this forest. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, well, so Cindy was all on board, like I said, from the very beginning, because she I think was very supportive. Yeah, I think two reasons. The, the lesser reason being that you know she's like kind of fabulous and wants to like you know, shine and dress up and be seen. But the greater reason is, you know, she saw it as an opportunity to spend time with me and to like possibly feel like she was doing something to make up for, you know, her, all the guilt she has as being a bad mom in her mind. So she was all about it. And she's got, I mean, and she's brazen. Like she obviously was willing to talk about anything and do anything. And uh, so Frank was obviously the more hesitant one. And their responses were actually inverted because, you know, Frank was like, oh, yeah, it was great. I, I came across pretty well. And my mom was like, oh, my God, I was like a heartbeat. You feel me in my curlers. You know, like she was more self-critical, I think, because I don't even think she realized how much she was yelling. I think in her mind it was going to be like, he's going to show me in all these great outfits and I'm going to be really funny and cool. And instead, there's a lot of, like, me catching her in lies and, you know, like, dredging up things she doesn't want to talk about. But then you know, they both ended up coming around. So we did do, like, a little bit of a festival run. And 
And people were, it was so great. Like probably one of the greatest moments in my life is that when I did, I did the Florida film festival um, and they were there. And when they came out, they got like a standing ovation from the audience. And, and I think that it sort of solidified uh, like that, you know, people were so proud, like you were so brave, you know, you're such great people. You've tried so hard for your kid, despite all the setbacks. And I think we came out of it like better in general, you know, like I stopped thinking that she was ever going to leave him. She kept, stopped saying she was ever going to leave him. Like it became so obvious in retrospect that like nobody was going anywhere, you know? <laughs> and at the same time, Frank start, started working that job at art center and, you know, it, like things really did take a turn for the, for the better after that. Yeah. Like, yeah. Cause they were so endearing despite, you know, their foibles and flaws to some people, to 48% of the people. <laughs> I mean, we're all human. We all make mistakes. But there was just something special, I don't know, that you captured. Do you think that has anything to do with the fact that you did already have a relationship with them and they were comfortable with you? Or do you think yeah. they would have been anyway? No, I think, I mean, obviously, they're, they're very unique people and that they could have been like that at all. But yeah. um because most people, no matter how interesting they are, can completely change if they realize that people are going to see it. And, you know, I, I think that they're a little more open in general, but also I, obviously me being their kid. I don't think if someone just showing up with a camera, they would have been able to, like, be as open about stuff. But, you know, it was kind of, like I said, it's sort of a happy accident that it came together. I don't know if I could ever recreate something like that sincere. You know, it's, yeah. It's, you know? Well, whenever you were filming and or editing, did it? Did you have any insights for yourself? Did you feel like you learned more about the dynamic or your life? I mean, yes, obviously. I God, I'd hope so after all that. <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> Through like 150 hours of footage. Um yeah, I learned a few things. I mean, I learned, you know, that my mom was more complicit than I probably used to think, you know, in, in all of it. And just as much of a problem as Frank was, I'd often just blamed him for everything because I resented so much that she had supported him for so many years financially, whereas I didn't get any help at all, you know. So I'd look at my student loans and be like, what the fuck? Frank has a studio. He has a studio after he trashed his studio and she made him a, built him another studio. And here I am like you know, massively in debt. And I was the good kid. <laughs> I well, was the nerd. Sure. <laughs> I mean, it, you don't come across as a bitter person during the film. And I was so amazed by that because I'm constantly <laughs> bitter. So is that false? Is that a false impression? I'm not, no, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm bitter. I mean, I think that the thing about Cindy because I was always like Cindy, I was close to Cindy. Frank was in and out of, he was living in Florida. He was playing in bands. He wasn't a big part of my life until I was probably a teenager because he was doing the club scene in Miami, you know? <laughs> so my relationship with my mom was kind of the central one. And despite all of the problems that she had, she always made it very clear. She like adored me, yeah. you know, and I could do no wrong. And even if I was neglected to a large degree or had to live with a bunch of different people or whatever, it was not any lack of love there, you know? And I even said this on This American Life. I was like, you know, if I came to my mom one day, I was like, oh, I, I might have killed somebody. She'd be like, all right, we need a shovel. We need a bag. We need some gasoline. You know, I might have to take the fall. I'll get some fingerprints on the body. Like, <laughs> just completely unconditional. Like, <laughs> right. And I and think so, that that came across. Yeah. And I think people that I meet that seem to have more psychological issues than I do have, like, parents that just, like, were distant and not there and, and yeah. like unsupportive or judgmental or, you know, like I, I feel like they might've been fuck ups, but at least I definitely always felt there was no shortage of love, you know, and as much as I rejected Frank, he so desperately wanted to be my, my dad, you know, <laughs> I was like, never. How do, why do you think Frank never um, gets frazzled? Like, you know, Cindy could be saying like, I'm going to, I want to kill you yeah. or whatever. And I think you should be killed. Yeah. <laughs> he's unaffected how do you think that works i mean that's clearly his personality type i don't know if i think that's like i don't know if it would have been ever been possible for them to have even had a relationship in the first place that if he hadn't have been that kind of person so there's a bit of a natural selection there in partners right. but i mean you get used to it you know when someone's like that big and operatic all the time i mean you just eventually learn not to take it too personally you know <laughs> 
Yeah. And I mean, he's drunk a lot of the time, too. So, like, true. probably that doesn't hurt. <laughs> so true. I didn't think of that. Yeah. Okay. So, that's just sort of the dynamic. And oh, and, other, and I was going to say other things that I learned. I mean, I definitely um, learned that I need to not let... I think I spend a lot of time trying to make Cindy feel like she... Like, I, I, I feel guilty about her guilt. Because she has so much guilt. I'm just like, let it go, let it go. So I'm constantly trying to make her feel like she has contributed, you know? Like, so she works for Roger Corman, and, like, she got me my first couple directing jobs doing Corman films, you know? And I'm like, that changed everything. You changed everything. You did it. You did it. Yeah. (laughs) That's so nice. And it's like I have to, you know, and there's, like, some Al-Anon stuff there, too, you know, like, like I definitely like like to take on lost causes and you know and I've tried to fix people and things like that but you know at the end of the day I think the biggest takeaway for me was I was kind of like less critical of their relationship because it sort of occurred to me that like no one would put up with either of them and they've grown together in such a way that even if it seems wildly dysfunctional like it's probably still for the best yeah yeah (laughs) did you have any regrets the things you wished you hadn't included or things you wish you had included um, I think my dog just slightly peed on me. Uh, <gasps> no, wait, do you need to take a break? There's a slight wetness on my lap that I don't know where it came from. Serious wetness. <laughs> oh, no, God. Forrest, what did you do? You know what? It she happens. got too excited. Don't shame her. <laughs> it happens to everyone, Forrest. Yeah, who among us hasn't peed during an interview? It's <laughs> fine. Um... <laughs> no, I wouldn't say there's anything I wish I ha- hadn't in- included. I mean, the the process that I did it was so rough. I mean, my biggest regret is that I didn't have time to sort of polish it, you know, because I had gone, I, I was in London. I was in a basement. This guy set me up in this basement and was like, all right, go to it. And I was like, I don't have to come here to do this. I could have done this at home. Yeah. And I'm spending all this money. Like I'm still paying. He, he's not like subsidizing me. So I'm blowing through all this money on like a apartment and food and all this stuff. Oh my God. And I went through it and I just watched all the footage and I would put like a star or two stars or three stars or four stars. But the computer he, he had one was so old that it had a tiny hard drive. So I couldn't digitize all the footage. I just picked all the five star stuff. And by the time I cut that five star stuff together, I had like a, like a two hour assembly. And then I was just a matter of cutting it down and I never added like establishing shots or inserts. I never, all the fonts were different. <laughs> like, I, I never... love that though. <laughs> Cause it felt like a reflection of the, the narrative. I don't know. Yeah. So there's a version of it that's a little less rough in, that I had kind of imagined that would have felt less like a home movie and more like a documentary. Um, but other than that, you know, I, I stand by it. <laughs> yes, you should. You should be so proud. And I, I have no um, doubt that you will just keep go- doing more and more amazing things. You don't have to think you peaked. Just, I mean, I mean, I'm not a one-hit wonder like Frank, no. like an IMDb says. <laughs> no, but even if you were, it'd be fine. <laughs> um, my sister wanted to know if you like the song "Whirly Girl." Not really. No. I like, I do really like their song, My Ride. They have another song called My Ride that is actually kind of a banger. Yeah. (laughs) Like genuinely. I mean, he seems talented. (laughs) He is. He's, he's an interesting guy. You know, he's Cuban immigrant. He never like went to school. Like he doesn't, he can't, can't spell. (laughs) <laughs> he never was formally trained, but he can literally play anything by ear. Like he can pick up an instrument, he can hear something, he can he can pick up a trumpet, just play it for the first time, be like, "All right, I got this." You know, okay. he's very technically proficient. It's just his taste is a little bit questionable. Is you know, this... like go ahead. I was just gonna say his obsession for the past like decade has been making Christmas music. Huh. So he's just constantly making these like. <laughs> Is he just a big fan of the holiday? Yeah, I guess. <laughs> That's crazy. Like, I, I once I, I filled out a MySpace profile for him, and it, it was like favorite music, and his answer was Christmas. Stop it. <laughs> that is the perfect answer. Come on. <laughs> yeah, that is, okay, that's the perfect answer. Yeah. Um, is it a strange thing for you? I, I assume people recognize Frank and Cindy. And have you been there when this has happened, where people are like, oh, my God, you're Frank and Cindy? Uh, no. What? I, I, 
Yeah, I've ne- never seen that happen. Um, I mean, I know they go to like, so like I live in South Pasadena. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's this really small town. It's got like the one Trader Joe's that everybody goes to. And it has like an old school video store, like the, called like Video Tech. And it's like the, <laughs> one of the last video stores in town. And they have a copy there. So it's hard for me to imagine that anyone who's rented that movie hasn't seen them at the post office or at Trader Joe's or at the Vons. I mean, it's such a small little place. But maybe if you saw the documentary and you saw them, you'd be like, oh, shit, that's those people. <laughs> well, people in L.A. do try to, like, play it cool, too. She's going to yell at me. I better not say anything. <laughs> God. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've been recognized once, which kind of blew my mind. I was, like, walking down the street here in Highland Park, and I, like, walked past the Cocos, and some random guy came up to me, and like, you're that guy. And I was like, I'm definitely not that guy. He's like, you're, no, you're that guy who made that documentary. <laughs> and how did that feel? Did you enjoy that? It felt awesome. <laughs> yes. I want everyone to know who you are. Uh, me too. It, it means like getting to do fun stuff. Yeah. You know? <laughs> like what's the goal? Like what's the dream? I know you still work in the industry though. You still do live in the life. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to be a working director. That was my goal ever since I was a kid, you know? And why? why did you, why did that appeal to you? I have an answer for this, actually. Yeah, good. I've thought about this a lot. It's because, so I went to college really young, right? Um, yeah, you did. I was in this weird program where I, I didn't go to high school, and I went straight to college. Because you were a prodigy. And I really didn't want to be in high school because I didn't get along with the other kids. <laughs> you don't get along with others. Okay. I mean, it was South Pasadena. Everybody was so, like, I basically I had, like, the friends I was closest with, looking back at now, were all the other kids whose parents were also not together, right? Like, there was, like, maybe three close friends of mine, and looking back, if I do the math, I'm like, huh, those were the kids who had single moms, you know? And and it was, like, such a little, like, you know, utopian city where everyone was, like, so middle class and boring, and, like, the church kids were, like, the coolest kids. And so, like, I had all this, like, cynicism and and, and anger, and so I just just couldn't do it, you know? So I go to this program, and, you know, you're supposed to declare a major kind of at two years in. And how do you declare a major when you're, I was 15, two years in? So I was like, I don't, I, I don't want to pick what I want to do for the rest of my life. So I took every class I could. I took all the sciences, all the humanities, all the art classes. And to me, film sort of became the one thing that combined everything. You know, it was writing, it was acting, it was production design, it was storytelling, you know, it was philosophy and anthropology and sociology. Like the art of making a movie, really, you can focus on any number of, of different aspects of it. You could purely make a, a movie like Death Race where it's just stupid and exploitative, or you can write something about a relationship break, breakup you just went through. You know, you really can't explore anything you want. And having had to choose something that early, that really seemed like the one where I couldn't go wrong, you know? And you can, still feel that passion. Unfortunately, I do. <laughs> do you but hate it, it? You wish you were more conventional? No, it is just the worst industry. It really is. It is so corrupt and so horrible. <laughs> and everyone's so fucking stupid. And you are beholden to all these horrible people all the time. All these bros who got yes. uh, like MBAs from Ivy League schools, who, you know, who are now like basically the people you have to cater to. Who's yes. A for you. It's horrible. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. You're preaching in the choir. And it's even worse because those guys want BJs from the <laughs> women in the industry. You know, of it's course like, they do. Yeah. it's transactional in that way. And it's so depressing. No, it's the worst. It's the absolute worst. Like, I used to complain about it all the time and be like, you know, I wish I was more successful. And I have this friend, Christian, who's like a programmer for Apple. And he's like, it's your fucking fault. You chose this industry. You made a deal with the devil. You can't complain. It's true. He's right. And I'm like, eh, I guess it's true. Yeah. I could have I done anything when I was a kid. Like, no, this is what I wanted to do, so... Well, yeah. were you allowed to be involved? I shouldn't say allowed. Were you involved in the remake, the, the film? Yes, yes. So that was sort of a weird story. It always left a bad taste in my mouth, to be honest with you. No. Um, I, my goal was to just have someone write it and have someone make it and have people go, oh, that was really good. Let's go see this documentary, yeah. right? But what ended up happening was I wrote it and I wrote a version of it that was like about 
the characters and not about not actually the documentary, but the producers were like, yeah, but we want all those great lines from the documentary. And so it ended up being actually about me making the documentary versus just a story of these characters in an otherwise different situation. And so it was like an odd premise for a film. You know, how many times you've seen everyone's like, this is about a guy who's filming somebody. Like it's rarely considered that interesting. Mm -hmm. And then the other problem was the character had my name. He was GJ because it was based on the documentary. So he couldn't be CJ or DJ or whatever. And I kept saying like, this is going to be weird. Like people are going to think that I like, I think I'm really important or something, but okay, as long as someone else directs it, it won't matter. And then finally, after them interviewing a series of directors and it kind of like falling through, Rene Russo was the one who said, you need to direct this. You're the only person who understands this. And I'm like, I'm so happy you believe in me, but this is going to be kind of a bad look. (laughs) Like, I don't know if anyone has ever directed a film where there's the main character in them with their name playing them, because then anyone who watches it thinks, what is this guy saying about himself? Oh, he thinks he's pretty smart. Oh, he thinks he's pretty good with the ladies. You know, it's like, it becomes this like exercise in narcissism in people's minds that it was never intended to be, you know? And so like, so it's like very hard for me to look at it objectively because it's sort of a weird carbon copy of a thing I already did. And even though like the performances are really good, people's reactions to it is more based on who's making it and why than the actual thing itself, you know? Yeah. And, and I would have really preferred for it to not have been about me making a film about my family. Like I would have heard it have been like Cindy and at work causing problems. Will she get fired? Stay tuned. <laughs> I mean, uh, Cindy at work could have been its own story, like its own film. Because just that part, I was like, I want to be there at her work every day. and see Drawing people. nasty pictures what? of her coworkers. Yeah, she's so impassioned, too. Like, <laughs> she, she gets really worked up about people. And and I'm sure I get it, because I'm sure it's an unpleasant life sometimes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the best version of that would have been just centered around her. Her <laughs> trying to keep her family afloat with this alcoholic layabout husband who she's trying to get, a, like, a job for, you know. Her trying to reconnect with her kid who wants absolutely nothing to do with them but is forced to live there because he graduated college and didn't know what to do with his life, you know. Like, so I think there would have been a story there really focusing on her attempt to kind of recover from her long addiction and to get her life on track. But I couldn't, I don't think I could have even been qualified to write that myself. You know, it's not, yeah. a pers- you know, so, so it's just kind of a weird thing. And I wouldn't say I'm not like grateful it happened, but it's just odd that that's, that was kind of another point in my life where I was like, oh, this is going to be my big break. You know, I've got these big name actors and then nothing really came, you know, like anything. It was just like, yeah, like the, the guy, it was just one guy who financed the money. And there wasn't really like a big plan, like, oh, we're going to um, do this huge ad campaign or market Rene Russo for an Oscar. It was like, once it was done, everyone was like, okay, it's done. And then the festivals were like, well, we prefer the documentary. And I was like, well, you didn't show the documentary, so yeah, <laughs> give right. me a break. Right. <laughs> so it just yeah. like, the, yeah, so it just ended up on Netflix, just like everything else, you know, and whether or not people watch it or not, I have no idea. It's just there kicking it, you know. I mean, you have a very strange life. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's just no two ways about it. It's interesting because it's like I've I've done so many things, but it never feels like they, they always seem like one-offs. I've never quite been able to build so that it it seems like it's a momentum where something leads to something leads to something leads to something, you know? Do you think that you'll just continue on this path? Hopefully not. (laughs) No, I mean, like, will you ever be like, I've had it. I can't take this industry anymore. These people are bozos. I've tried to, I've tried to wrap my brain around what that would look like. And unfortunately all the skills that I have are so specific to the industry. Yeah. I mean, at worst, I mean, if I was truly like, I'm done, I'd still be an editor most likely, you know, like, cause that's the skill that I actually can apply to things. Um, what am I going to do, go back to school? Like, fuck that. Uh, no, I would say that my goal is not to do this as I'm doing it forever. I still have kind of these fantasies of something that I've been developing actually being enough of a mainstream hit that I do get to the point where I'm like, 
comfortably working and getting offers and, and having something that resembles like more of a traditional career. Yeah. Like right now, for example, there's a script that is um, at, being packaged uh, of mine that I wrote with a friend um, with Taryn Killam uh, from SNL playing the lead. <laughs> and like, it's a completely mainstream romantic comedy. It's got, it's like Groundhog's Day. It's got like a little time travel thing. It's the kind of thing that would like be number one on Netflix for a few weeks, you know? Yeah. I just need something that like is a little more done through the channels of the industry and not completely myself because everything I've done up until now has been totally on my own with very little help from anybody, just hustling however I could or random things coming my way. Like Roger Corman calling me being like, Oh, you want to remake death race 2050 and me being like, fuck it. Sure. Let's go. Let's go to Peru. I'm down. I mean, are you in touch with that guy that left you high and dry in London? And like, I have, I did reach out to him. And yeah, kind of, what did you I, say? I, I reached out two years ago and I sort of got a dialogue going with him about like what he's been up to. And he mentioned that his former protege is directing commercials. And I was like, I'd love to direct commercials. So he called a bunch of commercial agencies that he's worked with. And every single one of them was like, great, we'll have lunch with you, but we don't want anybody else. And, Come you on. Know, he tried. I give him credit for trying, you know. All right. I guess that's something. <laughs> but um, I, have a day, I have a day job, too. I, uh, yeah. I do, like, post-production supervision for, like, the startup app. So it's not like I'm, I'm not bleeding money like I have been yeah. at different times in my life. So yeah. it's not like I'm not – I just – it would be nice to be – successfully in successful in a more creative way and i'm always trying you know only takes one thing really yes and i have no doubt you're amazing i have um some questions that were submitted by our listeners um uh, let's see well daniel wants to know why did do you think your mom didn't ever leave frank you know all those years she was supporting him and stuff um What's the saying? Bad money after good? No, throwing good money after bad. <laughs> it's like a slot machine that you can't walk away from. I think there was different phases. You know, I think in the beginning, she really did think that he was incredibly talented and was going to be very successful. And she was truly had faith in his ability to have a great career and kind of pull us all out of poverty. Uh, I think at some point it became more toxic where it was like, I'm, I can't give up now. I've already sunk so much into this, right. you know? And I witnessed so many times where she would invest in some new dream of his, like building in that studio and things like that. Um, but I think at the end of the day, they have a bond that even transcends that. And even if she is frustrated with him and even if he's a complete fuck up and he's been more of a fuck up than you, in his life than you even see in the film, you know, like he was blowing her money on cocaine and having girlfriends and, you know, like he was pretty bad. <laughs> But I think they, their personalities are so well suited for each other. And my mom, like, she, she tried to date, like, rich, successful guys, and they tried to c control her, and she's not having that. Like, no. she wants to control the narrative, and, like, he worships her. Like, he doesn't do anything without her. Like, he relies on her. For, like, literally, if he's having a conflict at work, he'll call her, like, what do I say? What do I do? <laughs> So to She's be like his life coach. Yeah. So to be that revered and to have that much power and to, yes. you know, be, you know, it's like, I, I just, I think that it works for them. Even if it doesn't seem like it does, it does, you know? Yes. Um, Matt wants to know, how did you realize your upbringing and parents were <laughs> bananas, especially when you grew up with it? Like how, when did it occur to you? Like, Oh, this is unusual. Yeah, that's a good question. I guess the truth of the matter is, is I did always sort of assume that behind the scenes people were dealing with crazy. Mm -hmm. um, whether I, I just figured like your experience is probably everyone's experience. Like I definitely didn't think like, oh, this is special. I knew that when I was, when my grandmother took me away and I, that was the worst. Like, when I was like five years old, my grandmother took me and I lived with different people for about three years and I cried every night. And I, you know, I had, I knew that that was rough. You know, I knew that that was maybe traumatic. And I felt like that sucked, but I didn't think any of it was particularly interesting. Right. You know, um, I would say that by the time I was a teenager and the shit was really hitting the fan and like Frank was doing the pills and then there was like the trash in the studio. Right. I definitely was like, this is extra bad for sure. But then I was always like, yeah, but I'm not being beaten. I'm not being like sexually assaulted, you know, like so it definitely seems like people have it worse than me. I'm a white kid in a middle-class neighborhood, you know? Yeah. 
I don't think it, it, like I said, I don't think it really occurred to me that it was like special in an interesting way until that solid gold moment that I talked about before where I was like, wow, now this is kind of uniquely bad in a way that is, is, makes me laugh. Right. And that's what I like about it because that's, and that's the, the, the thing. And that's why I put that dance video I did after Cindy crying is because it was like, I think the thing that, kept us all sane is is as humor you know like yes. frankly you have great senses of humor like despite everything you know and i like that they especially cindy can laugh at themselves oh yeah like, i think that that's crucial sometimes to like when i catch her in the lie she's like well it's not exactly like i told you i'm like well, what's funny <laughs> well and when you read that letter that she wrote like you did it reading of yeah. it, and she was just dying laughing at herself i love that <laughs> yeah because no. sometimes you gotta that's one of my favorite scenes and i feel like it's when nobody talks about because in that moment i felt like i could truly feel like our bond yes like we were both cracking up about her like serious <laughs> the earnestness the earnestness <laughs> that she sat down and took out a piece of paper and was like it is time to move on reinvented and reconstructed if necessary <laughs> don't you feel like we would all be a bit better if we could do that if we could just fucking laugh at our nonsense no, i know you have to i mean self-awareness is a trait that you would find surprisingly lacking in most people yeah maybe yeah. cindy's my life coach too <laughs> um okay let me see oh did frank ever fully come around to having his life taped i hope he did i hope he did by the 2015 film i guess he did right he made peace with it well he definitely wanted it to be over with you know he he had been pressured by cindy that he had to do it because yeah, remember then he said it was an imposition. Yeah, it's an imposition. Um, but I think he he did want ultimately to exercise because, you know, that final interview, we had not really talked about that stuff. And I didn't really want to talk about it. And, yeah. I, you know, <laughs> but I think he wanted to finally kind of set the record straight to me. And that was like maybe the only way we were ever going to do it. So, yeah, you know, he he was OK with it. You know, like, what are you going to do? It's OK. Yeah, he's all right. I mean, you know what? I don't, I don't want to say anything mean here, but, like, it's the least he could do. <laughs> it's the least he could do. <laughs> you said it. I mean, unless he sells that studio and pays off yeah. my student loan, you're getting filmed, pal. I agree. I'm on yes. your side. Are Frank and Cindy on Cameo? Because I would pay top dollar for that. <laughs> tell them tell to them. get on there. I should tell them. <laughs> for real. <laughs> Because I think they would enjoy it, too. Like, they could, perf- you know, perform. Oh, yeah, they love it. They love. I mean, if, if, if they're in a performative mood, then both they both love it. Okay. Yeah. Like, you could get them on Cameo, and maybe you could take a cut. <laughs> totally. You know what Good I mean? Idea. Like, finder's fee. Just something to kick around. Okay, last question. I've already kept you too long. Um, we ask everybody, what do you keep in the trunk of your car? If you have a car. I have a car, goddammit. Well, because a lot of people in New York don't have cars. <laughs> right, right, right. Now, if you live in L.A. and you don't have a car, though, I know, right? You are a problem to everyone you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, I can tell you exactly what I keep in the trunk of yeah, my car. Yeah, what's in there? Something so my, forest? My wife uh-huh. is like, a, I would say like a, a baby hoarder, like a, a mini hoarder. She's constantly collecting... Oh, I thought- <laughs> No, she hoards babies. No, no, she's like a a mild, mild hoarder, and she's all and she loves um, shopping at Goodwill and uh, and and reselling clothes, and and so she's got the entire car is full of bags and bags of clothes that she's like earmarked for either Crossroads, eBay, (laughs) or garage sale. Yes. That's what I she love had. that. Yeah. And it's just clothes everywhere. Like, there's a room over here that's just full of clothes. And I'm like, what are you doing with this shit? She's like, I'm going to have a garage sale. I'm going to have a garage sale. And does she ever? She does. She okay. does. Okay. Yeah. 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 Does but, yeah. your does... wife enjoy your film and your family? Yes. It's probably the only thing I've ever done that she unequivocally likes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. No, I like it. She's a very harsh critic, and I like it because I trust her. Like, I yeah. know that if she likes something, she's it's not honest. just bullshitting me. And I've definitely yeah. been with people like the Frank to my Cindy, who kind of, who are the kind of people that just like 
you know, sort of adore the person they're with unilaterally where like they can do no wrong. And I don't like that. Okay. I like, I like to have someone who's like, the real deal. yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. So, so she loves Frank and Cindy. Um, she's harsher on my other films for sure. And I am too, you know, like I, I never really had a chance to kind of like, like the movies I made with Roger Corman are Roger Corman movies for God's sakes. Like, you know, it's like make an action film, a racing action film in the future for 200 K. Like it's not, you can't do that and knock it out of the park. <laughs> it's not possible. Yeah. There so some limitations there. Yeah. But that's why I'm excited about this new project because it's like, if it actually were to happen, I would feel like it'd be the first time in my life where I wouldn't be held back, where I'd actually have the resources to do it. And I'm literally supposed to find out today. <gasps> and it's crazy. It's like, yeah, I know. It's too much. Let me look this at my phone. so exciting. Yeah, look real quick. What if you find... I got out? nothing. I got nothing. Okay, 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 okay. I'm going to cross my fingers. That is so exciting. I yeah. I just am going to be your biggest cheerleader and be um, supporting your career however I can because you are tremendous. You're so talented and impressive and an inspiration to other people that come from a long line of, you know... Well, gosh. That's For the, real, DJ. Some of the nicest things people have ever said to me so thank you it's really true you you're so talented and special and i hope you do know it um okay wait does cindy like your wife obsessed with her oh my god that's so great i'm so jealous <laughs> well they're uh, okay i mean they're a little similar okay so, i so, i don't blame you yeah they're a little similar i i i, I tried to avoid the uh, cindy archetype for most of my life but <laughs> somehow that's i ended up with i ended up with a fiery emotional blonde with the shopping addiction <laughs> it happens you know what very charming yeah. uh all right well you're off the hook i'm just so uh in love with your film frank and cindy i hope all of our listeners watch it it's on netflix and also as gj pointed out there is the fictionalized version as well that you can consume if you wish and renee is very very good in that i do i I do recommend it because of her performance she she is it's insane like she is cindy it's crazy that must have been so weird for you beyond yeah (laughs) wait i thought of one more thing and by the way i could do this all day (laughs) uh was it filmed at some points during uh, Halloween, or is the mummy always in the background? <laughs> yes, to both. <laughs> the answer is yes to okay, both. Okay, okay, because yeah, there was some unusual. Where she was making these dummies, um, like there was like Rock and Predator, and it was like Predator with like a like a guitar, and there was a, a mummy, and there was she was mi- building okay. these things for Halloween, and then they were so cool, they just stayed up year round at the end right. of the day. Yeah. yeah, she's very artistic. Okay, yeah. I see. No further questions. For real this time, I will stop. Yeah.